Welcome. In this lecture, we're going to explore some of the ideas that relate eigen decompositions to singular value decompositions and a computational tool. So objectives are to first define eigenvectors and eigenvalues for those of you that aren't familiar with them. We we'll relate the eigen decomposition of a symmetric positive definite matrix to the singular value decomposition. And then we'll look at that method of power iterations for computing the eigenvector with the largest eigenvalue. Now eigen decomposition is a concept that applies to square matrices. We're going to consider a matrix B, which is k by k, that'll have an eigenvector EI, which is a k by 1 vector, and an eigenvalue lambda i, which is a constant. And the relationship between these quantities is that if I take the matrix B and I multiply it times the eigenvector, what happens is I get this eigenvalue, which is a scalar, times the eigenvector. The notion is that matrix multiplication corresponds to scalar multiplication. Another way to think about it is, is if I view this matrix B as an operator that acts on an input vector, when I put EI in, what comes out is lambda i times EI. Again, the action of matrix multiplication for an eigenvector is equivalent to multiplication by a scalar. And in general, there can be capital K eigenvalues and eigenvectors for a given K by K matrix. Now, these eigenvalues can possibly be complex valued. And if we have distinct eigenvalues, then there's linearly independent eigenvectors that correspond to those. Repeated eigenvalues don't necessarily have a set of linearly independent eigenvectors associated with them. When this matrix is symmetric, then we have a guarantee that there are k, in other words, a complete set of orthonormal eigenvectors associated with that particular matrix. So let's suppose that we have a set of orthonormal eigenvectors, and we'll start from this relationship b times ei is equal to lambda i ei. And if we stack all these equations together for i equals 1 through k, we have b e1 is equal to e1 lambda 1, b e2 is equal to e2 lambda 2, and so on. You can verify using matrix multiplication that this relationship works fine. Well, because these eigenvectors are orthonormal, we can collect these E's into a matrix, which we'll call capital E, and this relationship that we wrote down is B times the matrix E is the matrix E times the matrix lambda, where lambda is a diagonal matrix with these eigenvalues on the diagonal. And since there's an orthonormal set of these EI's, we know that we can write the matrix E times E transpose is the same as E transpose E is equal to the identity. This just captures the various inner products between the different E sub I, and since each E sub I has unit norm, the inner product with itself is 1, and since it's orthogonal to the other E sub I, then the inner product between different eigenvectors is 0, and that gives us the identity. If we use this orthonormality, we can rearrange this equation to say that the matrix B can be written as E lambda E transpose. Or we expand this out in terms of a sum, much like we did when we wrote the singular value decomposition as U sigma V transpose. And because lambda is diagonal, gives us the sum from I equals 1 to K lambda I E I E I transpose. Well, there's a connection between the eigenvectors and eigenvalues of a symmetric positive semi-definite matrix and the singular value decomposition. To explore this connection, we're going to define an n by m matrix A, and we'll let the columns of the matrix A be A1, A2, through AM, and we'll define the rows of the matrix A to be X1 transpose, X2 transpose, down to Xn transpose, will decompose A in terms of its full SVD, U sigma V transpose. So in this case, both U and V are square matrices, and sigma has the same dimensions as A. Well, the first case we're going to consider is to define a matrix B, which is A, A transpose. Now you can see that this is going to be a symmetric matrix, because if I take the transpose of A, A transpose, I end up with the same thing. 
And I can write this in terms of the columns of the matrix A as the sum from i equals 1 to m ai ai transpose. So it's the sum of the outer products of all the columns. Well, substituting the singular value decomposition for A, we find that B can be written as U sigma V transpose V, sigma transpose U transpose. Since V transpose V is the identity, this simplifies to U sigma sigma transpose times U transpose. We can expand sigma sigma transpose and see that it's a diagonal matrix with sigma 1 squared down through sigma M squared, and then zeros once we get past M, so this is an N by N matrix. And this now looks like the form of the eigen decomposition of B, because remember that was a matrix of orthonormal vectors E times a diagonal matrix times E transpose. So we see that the left singular vectors of A end up being the eigenvectors of B, and the eigenvalues correspond to the squares of the singular values because we've assumed that n is greater than m, there are a number of zero eigenvalues. And those correspond to these diagonal entries in the lower right. So let's consider the other case where we define the matrix B to be A transpose A. So in this case, B is an m by m matrix, whereas previously we had B was an n by n matrix. We can think about B as a sum of the outer products of the rows of A. Replacing A by its singular value decomposition, we see that B is given by V sigma transpose U transpose U sigma V transpose. And again, U transpose U is the identity, so I'm left with V sigma transpose sigma times V transpose. And expanding out sigma transpose sigma, we see that's a diagonal matrix with sigma i squared, the singular values uh, squared on the diagonal. So this again takes the form of an eigen decomposition. We have a matrix with orthonormal columns, a diagonal matrix, and then the transpose of this matrix on the left with orthonormal columns. So here we conclude that the right singular vectors of A are equivalent to the eigenvectors of B, and the eigenvalues are given by the squares of the singular values. So in both these cases, we have the same set of non-zero eigenvalues, and depending on whether we want the left or the right singular vectors, we can use either the form A, A transpose, or A transpose A. This correspondence now gives us a tool for computing the first principal component or the singular vector associated with the largest singular value. And so we're going to assume that we have a matrix A, which is n by m, where n is much, much bigger than m. And we want to find V1, the first principal component, the component that is associated with the span of the rows of the matrix A. And this is the right singular vector associated with the largest singular value of A. And similarly, it's the eigenvector of the matrix B, which is A transpose A, where this is an M by M matrix. Now B, you'll notice, is M by M. And since N is much greater than M, B is actually a much smaller matrix than A would be. Recall in the previous page that we wrote B as the sum of XI, XI transpose, so we can actually calculate B even if N is too large to store the entire matrix A in memory. So we just accumulate the outer products of the individual rows of the matrix A. Now the power iteration is the following algorithm. We start by picking a random vector, which we're going to call C sub 0. And then we iterate. We let K run from 1, 2, and so on until this algorithm converges. And what we do at each step is we find CK as B times CK minus 1 divided by B CK minus 1 to norm. So what we're doing is at each iteration, we're multiplying by the matrix B, and then we're normalizing that result. Now once this converges, we can show that V1, the right singular vector corresponding to the large singular value, is equal to the ending value of C. First, we're going to notice that when I do this iteration, B times CK minus 1, that if I go back to what I started with with C0, CK 
involves b times b and so on, k times times c0. So b c k minus 1 is equivalent to writing the matrix b raised to the kth power times c0. And we can raise a matrix to the kth power. That just means we multiply it times itself that many times. So let's consider this problem of raising the matrix b to the kth power. We'll substitute the eigen decomposition of b and that's going to be v lambda v transpose k times in here and the v transpose v terms cancel out to give us the identity so we end up with a v on the left then inside we have lambda times lambda times lambda k times so that's lambda to the k and then v transpose on the right now what we're going to do is take this random initial vector that we started with c0 and we'll express that with respect to the eigenvectors v as a basis. So the g's are just the coefficients associated with each of these basis vectors in v. So b to the k times c0 is v lambda to the k v transpose. That's b to the k. And we'll replace c0 by vg. And again, we have a v transpose v. So this is equivalent to v lambda to the kth power times g. So here I've repeated the iteration that we had on the previous page, where ck is b times ck minus 1 divided by the norm of b ck minus 1. And we can express that in terms of the eigenvectors of b, v, and the eigenvalues raised to the kth power, and g. Well, let's expand out v lambda to the k times g. This is v1, v2, vm, so those are the columns of v. And then I'm going to have lambda 1 to the k, lambda 2 to the k, lambda m to the k on the diagonal, and g just tells the elements g1, g2 through gm. Now it's convenient here to factor out lambda 1 to the k and g1. So I'm going to leave v alone, so I'll write this as lambda 1 to the k g1 times v, and now I have to absorb lambda 1 to the k and g1 into the terms that remain. We can divide each of these eigenvalues by lambda 1 to the k. So we'll have lambda 2 divided by lambda 1 to the k down through lambda m divided by lambda 1 to the k. And then we'll divide by g1 when we factor that out from this term. So that's 1 g2 over g1 through gm over g1. Well, because we've ordered these eigenvalues from largest to smallest, we know that lambda i over lambda 1 has to be less than 1. Therefore, lambda i over lambda 1 to the k goes to 0 as k gets big. Because if we take a number which is less than 1 and we raise it to a power, it keeps getting smaller. So for k big enough, this goes to 0. That implies that this quantity v lambda to the kth power times g approaches lambda 1 to the k g1 times v and then this matrix, when I raise it to the kth power, is going to approach a 1, and then it'll be zeros the rest of the diagonal. And the only term that thus matters in our normalized g vector is the 1 in the first place, because these zeros are going to wipe everything else out. So this becomes lambda 1 to the k g1 times v1. So now we can take and find what our iteration converges to as k gets large. You see that ck becomes lambda 1 to the k g1 v1, and then we're going to divide that by its 2 norm. And the lambda 1 to the k and the g1 factor out, so we're left with v1 over the norm of v1, and that's just v1. So this very simple iteration of taking a random vector, multiplying by the matrix, and then normalizing, and repeating that process, is guaranteed to converge to the right singular vector associated with the largest singular value. Now you can do various modifications of this algorithm to get, say, the second singular vector, or if you want the left singular vectors, you can do this with A times A transpose rather than A transpose A. There's a number of variations, but it's a very simple algorithm, and it can be effective when you have very, very large dimensional problems because you don't even have to store the entire matrix in memory to do matrix vector multiplication.